Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming out on this very cold and wet Wednesday evening. I am so pleased to introduce our guest speaker tonight, a man who has found success as an academic, a scholar, a practitioner, and now as chairman of a little-known organization called the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm speaking, of course, of Jay Clayton, who was nominated to chair the SEC on January 20th, 2017 by President Donald Trump and when, who was sworn in on May 4th. Prior to joining the commission, Chairman Clayton was a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell LLP, where for over 20 years he advised public and private companies on a wide range of matters, including securities offerings, mergers and acquisitions, corporate governance, and regulatory and enforcement proceedings. Thank you so much for coming here, Chairman. I know it was a little touch and go for a few days, but we certainly are glad you could make it. Sharing the stage with the Chairman is our own illustrious Joe Grunfest, the W.A. Frank Professor of Law and Business at Stanford Law School, and also Senior Faculty for the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Before joining the law school faculty in 1990, Professor Grunfest was a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission, served on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and was an associate at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. He also had a lot more hair. <laughs> that, I will hand it over to you, Joe. <coughs> Your photos, unfortunately. So, so, Jay, it really is a treat to have you out here in Silicon Valley and have you here on, on the West Coast. Um, you've been in your position for a while now, all right, and wonder if you could share some initial impressions about the current state of the SEC, what your visions are for the agency and its future, and where you see the markets going. Okay, well, it's very nice to be here. It's a pleasure Thank to you have very you. much, and if, if this is a cold night, now I know why you all live here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so it's bad. It's not bad. It's, it's not, not so bad. bad. We have no right to complain. <laughs> yeah. This is this is sweet. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and what have I learned in addition to listen to former commissioners? <laughs> well, you know, it's not all of the former commissioners. It's not all. Uh, I can I can introduce you to a couple of my former colleagues where maybe we just want to let those slide by a little bit. No, it's been it's been uh, it's been very nice getting to know you. Um, as part of the process of being chairman. And, and I think we, we both share one thing. Uh, people ask me what, what surprised me the most about taking this job. And I knew, I knew, I knew some aspects of the SEC. I, think, I, I thought I knew them pretty well. I thought I knew the division of corporation finance pretty well. And I, I had an idea about investment management and some of that, and a little bit about enforcement, uh, but the breadth uh, and I, I was in the San Francisco office today and mentioned this as well. The breadth of topics that the SEC has to cover every day uh, was astonishing to me. And it, and it ranges from you know, frauds that are retail frauds that the enforcement division is dealing with to um, sophisticated people who are trying to gain advantage by manipulating our markets to trying to facilitate capital formation um, you know, international issues, uh, and that's just, I, I haven't even touched on all the aspects of market structure, how our trading venue should work, and these are the questions that are being asked every day, um, and you have, to, you have to rely on a dedicated career staff for the place to work. Exactly. So we come and go. Mm -hmm. But the staff, the commission, commissioners come and go, but the staff is forever. Yep. So figuring out how to manage, and we have people from the SEC staff in the office or in the, or in the room now, uh, but developing the skill of working with the SEC staff, I think, is one of the critical uh, elements of, of success uh, as a chairman or a commissioner. I yeah. would agree. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a little story about my, my early days uh, where I was trying to explain to the staff how I thought we should get some things done and we weren't exactly seeing things eye to eye. Um, so there was a release and I thought it needed to be written a particular way. I called down Cork Finn, called down to Cork Finn and then Linda Quinn was the head of the group there. Spoke with Linda, I said, listen, we need future. She goes, Joe, don't worry, we got it. Week goes by, all right, get a next draft. It's not close, okay? Mark it up, additional comments. Joe, got it, understand. Week goes by, next draft. It's now off in a totally different direction. 
So what I decided to do was I actually knew how to type, and we had these little computers back in the 1980s. So I stayed late one night, and I just started rewriting the rule proposal. And Linda came up to my office, and she said, I heard you're still here. You know, it's like 9 o'clock. Commissioners shouldn't be here at 9. I said, yeah, no, I understand. What are you doing? I said, I'm rewriting the proposal. Horror. Look of horror. Uh, and I said, well, you know, it's not a problem. I'll have it done in 10 minutes, and I'll let you see it in the morning. All right? Um, that's the power of the pen. All right? And, and, you know, one of the things that I learned in dealing with the staff is, is sometimes, in order to get the staff to move in a direction that, for any number of reasons, often entirely legitimate, they don't want to, you've got to do the work yourself because they're going to manage you, all right, and they're not going to get it done the way you would actually want it done. I hope I'm not speaking out of school with the SEC staffers here. Um, <laughs> but tell me, what are, your, what are your priorities? You know, do you, do you come to this job with a vision? Do you come to this job with the idea that I'm going to be in it for a finite period of time and for me to look back on my tenure with a sense of satisfaction and success, I want to be able to say I did these three, four, eight, 26 things. Yeah, let me, let me, I'll answer that specifically, but sure. let me just go back to the staff because it's part of the answer, mm -hmm. which is the size of the SEC is tiny. It's 4,600 people. Um, it's a budget that is 1% of the revenue of a large, large bank. It's one 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 thousandth of one percent of the revenue of our financial sector. Um, our forty six hundred people is two percent of our largest bank in terms of people. Um, our budget is twenty percent of the IT budget at J.P. Morgan. And yet we have to cover that. So, but you so have, here's but you, have, but you have leverage. But have, you have subpoena power. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Joe, they don't. Joe, Joe guess you what? Have, you have magic powers that they we, lack. We, we have subpoena power. And we have, most of all, we have our goodwill. Exactly. Because you have subpoena power. You could bring a lawsuit and subpoena people. Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but my subpoena <laughs> power today isn't what, isn't what it used to be when yeah. I was a commissioner <laughs> of the SEC. But we have, we, have, we have power like that. Um, but our power... And this goes to my goals. Our power is our goodwill. Our power is our reputation. We, have the, we do have the ability to subpoena people. We have the ability to bar people. We have the ability to fine people, although Congress constrains that. Um, the Supreme Court can constrain other things. Um, but most of all, we have the fact that when we call, people pick up the phone. Or when we talk, people listen. And that's driven by actually knowing the markets. So when I am finished with this, what I want is for people to say that that agency knows their business well. Mm -hmm. They know how to do what they're doing. They know how the markets work. If they're in enforcement, they know what people are doing that they shouldn't be doing and they're watching. If they're in trading in markets, they know how markets have evolved as a result of technology and they're trying to take advantage of technology. If it's corporation finance, they know that the way people raise money is different today than it was before, and we've got to try and facilitate that. And if, if there's, you know, that would, I would feel extremely satisfied if that's the way people looked at the commission when I'm finished with this job. Well, you know, you mentioned the magic word out here in Silicon Valley, and that's technology. All right, and technology is, I think, hacking our capital markets from the inside and from the out. And it's presenting sets of challenges that the framers of the statute never considered, and that the commission, when it wrote the various rules trying to govern today's markets, also never considered. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> excuse me. And and these challenges are are really multiplying, and they're also morphing into forms that that can be, excuse me, <coughs> difficult to predict and mm -hmm. and attack. Um, <coughs> I'm coming down with a crud, in case anybody is unclear. Um, <coughs> the big issue that people have been focusing on, thank you, sir. The big issue people have been focusing on are these initial coin offerings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could share some perspectives 
about where the agency stands on that. So, <coughs> so this is this is the buzz, um, initial coin offering. Let's let me try and unpack this. Let's stipulate that there are initial coin offerings that are, involve securities, that the coin is a security. Okay, let's, let's put that, we can have that debate if you want, but let's just put that debate to the side for a moment. Um, what I see happening is we kind of have, we've, we've had a divide in this country as to how we let people raise capital. We've had the private placement market where investors have to qualify or, and you have to have a limited number and there are procedural elements to the private placement market that keep it from becoming fraudulent. Those procedural elements are, you don't get to have a general solicitation. You can't go on television or otherwise and well, market the offer. can, 506C. Of but course you can. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. Th I'm talking about general principles, Joe. All right. You're, see, like you're too good a lawyer. I, ap I apologize. <laughs> so, you, you know, you can't generally solicit, and, and you can't offer immediate secondary liquidity. Those are kind of the concepts that are embedded in the, in the securities laws, where if you want to do a public offering, you register, and if you register, you can sell it any way you want, as long as you deliver a prospectus, right? Got, I have that right. And you can offer immediate secondary liquidity. Those are kind of the, and what I see happening in the ICO market is, <coughs> hey, let me have all of the disclosure freedom of a private placement, but all of the secondary liquidity and ability to market this of a public offering. Well, you know, we decided in right. 1934, that led to a lot of problems. Yep. And it's still leading to a lot of problems. We have huge sets of problems. And, and the question that some people are asking is, what's the SEC doing about it? And is the SEC doing enough? So to date, the SEC has brought three enforcement actions, mm -hmm. and there's been 121A report. And you know, among the enforcement actions was, was one against Munchie, mm -hmm. where you guys shut down the Munchie ICO right at the same time that California had legalized recreational marijuana. Now, is there a connection there, Jay, going after Munchies at the time of legalization? And, and realistically, if you look at the free offerings that you've gone after, it's hard to distinguish them from hundreds of other offerings mm -hmm. that you can find online where the white papers are available, where these offerings are directed into the United States, where it's an unregistered sale of securities with no valid exemption. That's sort of apparent mm -hmm. on the face of the offering. And yet you've gone after only three when there are hundreds that look almost identical. Why? <laughs> How many hours in a day does one have? I, I, yeah. I'm ready. Uh, 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 right. Look, I, th I think that the three offerings we've gone after in the 21A report um, make it pretty clear to people what we think is permissible and not permissible. And responsible people, including yourself, I think agree with the way we've outlined the way the law applies to this market. Absolutely. I have not seen many people disagree with the way the law applies to this market. Um, if this market continues as it is, those will not be the last enforcement actions that we bring. That's the way it works. You know, I would love to see people start trying to come into compliance, having seen now where the law is clearly, you know, clearly should be driving them. But if they're not, you'll see many more enforcement actions. You gave a very fascinating talk two or three days ago where you talked about, you spoke of the ability of the SEC to bring proceedings against the lawyers who advise some of these ICOs. And, and you know, many lawyers are unaware about the SEC's authority to go after members of the bar, right, under 102E. Uh, and you, you spoke to that very directly. It was a little bit like rattling a saber and, and you know, people had learned at the commission over the years that threatening to go to war with the bar is a dangerous step to take. What's your thinking about the idea that maybe we actually need to sue the lawyers that are working on some of these ICOs? 
I, I don't think the bar <coughs> would be very upset with any regulator who gave a lawyer a hard time who was clearly giving bad advice in a space like this after being informed about where the law lies. Okay. I, I, I have more faith in the bar. I think if there, you know, look, when, when things are closed, mm -hmm. I could absolutely see the bar saying, you know what, we're trying hard. You shouldn't give people who have to make close. I've had to make close calls in my career. I had to make a lot of close calls. Mm -hmm. I would not want to be second guessed on making those close calls. But when you're making a call that's nowhere close, close to the to line, the line. I don't, think, I don't think the bar is going to have a hard time. And that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, you know, somebody who's doing a legitimate job trying to find out what's okay and what's not okay, um, that I think that person, you know, is problematic. But some of the offerings that we're seeing, if the lawyers are telling them they're okay, they're, wrong. It, they're just plain wrong. Right. So, it, so it's interesting. I'm trying to understand the subtext. What you're suggesting is people should, lawyers should be aware. We've made them aware. Right. And you know, we, I, look, I mean, you know, let's, let's unwind the, the tape Exactly. Here. We've put out the 21A report. Yep. We've brought actions. Yep. Uh, my colleagues at the commission and I have told people where we think the law is. Responsible people in the bar, like yourself, have said, you know what? They're right. That's where the law is. If you're substantially departing from that in order to facilitate an offering that not only you know, looks like an IPO, but sounds like an IPO, ICO. So, Let's, so, the review, you know, so, so I, I wanna, where, wanna, where, where are we going then? I want to make sure that I understand this and that the lawyers in the room understand this, because yeah. this is fascinating and different. T tell me if I'm mischaracterizing your position. I want to get it right. There was a period of uncertainty. You're more articulate than I am, so no, no, go no, ahead. no, no, no. <laughs> there was a period of uncertainty where people were groping for the possibility, trying to figure out how to handle these ICOs. Mm -hmm. The commission has made various statements, and at some point in this process, it should be absolutely clear that these ICOs, some of these ICOs, are securities offerings. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is that point after the 21A report? Is it? You know, after the Munchie prosecution, is it after you went, you know, after Zaslavsky? I see what you're saying. Am I, am I going to put a date on it? No, I don't think can't. I should put a date on it, but I can tell you that At least not in this room I, with the camera I, running. I, you I, don't want to do that. I, I know. I don't think so. But I, yeah. I think we can say that date, wherever that date is, yeah. it's passed. All right. <laughs> that's, you see, now, now that's, <laughs> that's very, very important. All right. That's news. Okay. All right. Because what it means is that some lawyers that have been advising in this space that may have advised for ICOs that are the unregistered sale of security with no valid exemption, just flat out, that these lawyers may wind up in your crosshairs, and that rather than going- And, and Joe, to, let's, let's be clear. That's not a novel issue. Our, when, they, when we drafted, uh, we, we, you right. and I weren't around, yep. but when the very smart people who lived through the crash of the 20s and what was caused by hype you know, drafted the securities laws. Correct. They said, you know what? They're professionals hanging around these offerings. Gatekeepers, sure. And they have responsibilities. Absolutely. This is not a new deal. But look, just between us, Jay, all right? And, the, and, and, How, and 100 of your closest friends. 100, well, actually, <laughs> actually closer to 300. Uh, actually, the SEC very rarely sues lawyers. They've right? done a great job. So what you're saying is we're going to go against the norm at the SEC right. where you typically no, go after the company first and then maybe you go after the lawyer. I don't know, Joe, let, let's, just, let's just say, Joe, like you said, we're in a new paradigm. <coughs> yes, we are. Because technology has brought something to us that is new. Yep. Um, I believe that the securities bar, for as long as I've been practicing, has been an extremely responsible bar that has acted as, acted well as gatekeeper. Nothing's perfect, mm -hmm. but pretty well. Here we are. It's time to step up again and act responsibly as gatekeepers. So for those of you who are lawyers in the room, 
I, you know, and work in the ICO space or have partners who work in the ICO space, there's something to talk about at lunch tomorrow. Okay? <laughs> um, let me shift gears if I may, Jay. Um, Silicon Valley is, has long been concerned about the dearth of IPOs as an exit from the VC process. Mm -hmm. We're now in an environment where well over 90% of, of successful exits are done through M&A and fewer than 10% of companies that have a successful <laughs> exit uh, actually go public. Mm -hmm. What, can, first, do you think that's a problem? And second, if so, what is the SEC gonna do about it? So, do I think it's a problem from the perspective of capital formation generally? Right. Not a big one. Okay. We seem to have a, a very good private capital formation market. Would a, on balance, is more, is, is more capital formation possibilities, you know, keeping investor protection where it should be better? Yes. But we have pretty, we, I don't, does anybody lack for capital in Silicon Valley? I would actually say that in some areas we have too much capital. Okay. So, and there are some geographic issues. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that there's so much venture capital in Silicon Valley. And then if you look down the middle of the country, you have, you know, a hundred of the Fortune 500 that are kind of down the Mississippi Valley. We and can not a, and, we, and we can deal with that. Let me, right. let me go back to your question. Yep. What bothers me more about the relative size of our public capital markets mm -hmm. and the concentration at the, in the very large companies is the opportunity set of equity capital for retail investors to participate in is smaller. Correct. Retail investors cannot participate effectively in the private equity capital markets. It's pretty, it's very expensive for them to do so. They, they can only do it very indirectly. Very indirectly. When, for example, Fidelity might, you know, buy into a later stage, you know, Uber or Lyft, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of offering or what have you. But, you know, the other, the other observation. But if Fidelity buys, tell me if I'm wrong, if Fidelity buys into Uber or Lyft at the later stage, it's usually only 5% five, <coughs> five of a fund. Oh, it's, it can't even be that much. Right, um, you know. It's a, it's a small it's percentage. It's a small percentage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so your, but, your exposure is necessarily very small to a big part but the of small, our market. But it's interesting, the small retail investor never really had access to those deals. And, and the reality is, you know, the, the way many of these capital markets work is that not all money is created equal. And there's some situations where companies want to take money from some investors because that money comes with assistance and insight and contacts and advice and if what you're just doing is taking dumb money, then as a practical matter, you're, you're just trying to you know, get the highest possible price for you know, a placement that you're doing, and you really don't care very much. Well, you know, this may be the result of living around the world, but the fact that through, <coughs> through a large portion of our middle class, people in this country did have access to those opportunities as the country grew, mm -hmm. was better for our country than other places. So on balance, <coughs> if without changing capital formation, I can increase the ability of retail investors to participate in the growth of America, I'd like to do it. But that's gonna be really hard because of the change in technology and the change in economics. Maybe, maybe we can use technology to help us. All right, I'd love that challenge. How would we do it? Uh, you know, look, we have a lot of indirect investment these days. Right. You're talking about the limits of fun. There, I, I do not want to have a capital market system where the sophisticated people get the growth capital right. and the unsophisticated people have only the mature capital. That's where we are. So you want to change that? I think we should, I sure think we should look at it, Jay. Okay. I, I, I think it's a fascinating observation, and it's a real challenge to try to figure and out. And it's a result of the shrinking, the shrinking relative attractiveness of the public capital right. markets. And, and the number of publicly traded securities is now down approximately 50% yeah. from its peak in 1996. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at the same time, we're telling everybody that you have to do more for yourself in terms of your retirement. Correct. And you do. And you do. Yep. So, so that's kind of a 
thing that so tells there, me we got we to do something here. Is there something that the SEC can do with its current portfolio of regulations to try to make the IPO process more appealing, more effective, more attractive? So one of your, one of your Silicon Valley brethren, Bill Hinman, sure. has agreed to come to the commission. And you, you were very lucky getting uh, Bill. He's we were all guy. lucky. Yep. We were all very lucky. Um, and Bill and his staff have already taken steps that have made it more attractive, a more attractive alternative for companies in the middle of growth to come to the public capital markets. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking in particular of expanding the confidential filing process? Expanding the confidential filing process for pre-IPO companies, thinking about how to do direct registration. Mm -hmm. you know. well, and, so and, I would, and I would say, you know, watch this space because Bill is... Bill Innovative. and his team uh, are thinking creatively, he's a great guy. but they're thinking creatively knowing that they've got to maintain at least the same level of investor protection. So I know that you can't comment about specific transactions. Um, there is a rumor that a certain company, won't be named, is going to do a direct IPO. All right. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the current IPO process in the United States is typically described as firm commitment underwriting where you hire a bunch of investment banks, unless you are a mega offering, you typically pay about 7%, all right, for underwriting commissions, and then you've got another six month period after the IPO where the insiders, the venture capitalists, the executives are locked up and they can't get any liquidity. Mm -hmm. There's an alternative path that historically has been used only by smaller biotech companies, but now appears to be on the radar at the SEC with a very large consumer-oriented company that many of you might know. And what they're proposing to do is simply have a bunch of their existing shareholders sell stock at a price that's determined by the opening cross on the New York Stock Exchange. So the way the system works today, you really have two price discovery mechanisms. The first price discovery mechanism, the underwriters, they build the book and then they do an IPO and the company goes public and I'll make up a number, $18 a share. And then trading starts a few hours later on the New York or the NASDAQ and that trading can be at $22 or at $14. There's no fixed relationship between the IPO price and the price of the first cross. What this company is seeking to do is to get rid of the process by which the investment bankers set the IPO price and go immediately to the first cross. And if they're able to do that, the two big effects are number one, you don't have to pay the 7%, you'll have other fees, right? but you don't have to pay the 7% underwriting. And number two, you don't have the six month lockup. All right? And you know, those of you in this room who know, you know Black-Scholes option theory, what's the price of a six month put on a really volatile stock, which is many IPOs? All right? So that might actually be something that could change the market in a fundamental way. Were some a direct listing, and there are there have been direct listings. Mm -hmm. Were I, I want to go, I want to tie this back to what we were talking about Absolutely. before, which is everything you posit, you know, for the right company at the right time, probably makes sense. But they will have to file the appropriate registration. Precisely, they'll go through the same the, process the with the, the SEC. investors. The investors will get the disclosure yep. that that they need to get, mm -hmm. and Section Five will apply. And section, all right, eleven. Yeah. All right, and say so. In other words, all of the anti-fraud protections will will attach. The only thing that happens is you eliminate the need for the traditional role of the investment banker, and instead of having two price discovery processes, you go immediately to the floor of the exchange and you have a single price yeah. discovery. I mean, the mechanics of how, but the, right. the, the principles are. Do you think do you, if if that winds up working, do you think that that's really going to change the economics and the dynamics of taking companies public? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there, there, having done a number of public yeah. offerings, there are a lot of dynamics to the, to the appropriate distribution of your stock mm -hmm. and how it trades going forward. I mean, let's go to yeah. another problem that people identify in our public markets, right. which is unless you have enough stock trading. Exactly. You don't have liquidity. You don't have you enough don't, liquidity. You don't have coverage. And if you don't have enough liquidity, it's not attractive for people to buy in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there are a lot of there are a lot of dynamics to our market. 
that would factor into whether the type of process that you're talking about becomes well, a one-off process or something 10 people do, you know. Or but, but we should keep trying to find ways to facilitate good companies coming into our public capital markets. Or it starts with a certain large company doing it and then it evolves and it morphs and smaller companies are able to do that over time as well. I think that's another possibility. What about internationalization? And then we're gonna to go to questions from, from the audience because technology and internationalization are tied in a very close way. Uh, many of these ICOs, for example, come in from, from abroad. And you know, in my class just last week, I wanted to show the, the, the students a particular white paper and I just they typed in the URL, I got an error message. And the fascinating thing is the error message was in Polish, okay? So, you know, right away you knew where, where this was actually coming from. Um, internet communications now make it trivially easy for a group of people in Poland to structure an ICO and to offer those, those, those securities in the United States and anywhere else in the world. Uh, and if there's a problem, um, are you going to have your Warsaw office uh, try to go after these people? Uh, you know, we don't. How many how many employees do you think we have outside the United States, Joe? Oh, gosh, I would guess the number is about as close to zero as you can get. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think there'd be a problem if you had any outside the United <laughs> States. <laughs> so you know what this this is. This, there are a lot of things that we, look, the people at the commission every day, we think about the markets, we think about efficiencies, but most of them go to bed at night thinking about the individual investor. Mm -hmm. and we wanna do a lot to help the individual investor. I don't wanna see, look, we can go, let me go back to kind of ICOs right. and then how they trade on these platforms afterwards. Sure. I don't know that this point has been made. When you trade a stock, a NASDAQ stock, an NMS stock, there, there are a lot of protections built into the way stocks trade on an exchange. It's not a free-for-all. There are rules about how the end of the day has to work. There are rules about how the beginning works, rules about how much you can trade at any one time, whether you can use leverage or not use leverage, you know, whether you can manipulate the stock in different ways by being on both sides of a transaction. All those rules apply. And the exchanges, along with uh, our oversight, we do a pretty good job of administering those rules. These platforms that you're seeing where people are trading cryptocurrency, they have none of those rules. It's not the same kind of trading. The opportunities for manipulation are orders of magnitude. You know, right. just, just because a price flashes doesn't mean it has the same kind of protections. It doesn't, in, in the, it doesn't even mean that a real trade has actually happened, much mean. less a trade at that price. Yeah. All right, uh, the, the problems in that market, in the, in the exchange market for these cryptos, mind-boggling. So don't, so don't make the mistake of thinking because it's a, a quoted price, that that it's, it's, a the real same price. As the, that it's the same as a quoted price on NASDAQ. A huge difference. Or on, an, on the New York Stock Exchange. Absolutely okay. huge difference. All right. Let's now, go to now the let, me go, let me go to the Wausau point. Sure. I don't, what bothers me is I don't think anybody would, would say, if they got a call from Wausau, Mm -hmm. person said, how about buying a share of stock in my company? I'm not gonna send you any information, but it's great. Right. Who would do, would do that? But, but if you ICO. But if, but if you pop it up on a platform and say it's an ICO. And you use the magic word blockchain. And use the magic word blockchain. Right. People are like, I'll send my money to Poland tomorrow. Exactly right, which is what people are doing. Yeah. And you know what the SEC is doing. There's doing. not much I can do about that. You've been issuing warnings. I know. But, and, they, but, and, they, and they become increasingly vocal and strident. Mm -hmm. All right, you, you know, maybe your next warning will begin, listen, idiots, okay? Um, I thought Blockchain RS got us that. Yeah, no, 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 I think, I think some, of your, some of your warnings have already been pretty close to, listen, idiots, all right? Um, you know, you're sending your money out of the country, you're doing it in the form of blockchain, guess what? We can't get it back for you, all right? So, so if, if that analysis is right, are we in an environment where the combination of technology, investor preferences, the fact that people see so much money they think haven't been made in, in Bitcoin and the like, is now leading to a situation where 
Foreigners are directing offerings into the United States. They're getting Americans to buy unregistered securities with no valid exemption, and the money is gone, and there's nothing the SEC can do about it. Just like if somebody from Wausau called and said, would you like to buy a secure stock, and you sent it. There you go. But with ICOs and the internet, you don't even need to make the phone call, and you don't tell the people you're from Warsaw. Technology is great. Technology is fantastic. Technology is fantastic, but yeah. fraudsters know how to use it, too. Right. It's, it, 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 it's great, particularly if you're running a fraud out of Warsaw in some situations. Yeah. And I like Warsaw. Oh, I love Warsaw. Yeah. Yeah. We probably picked it's, it's a great city, yeah. great university, <laughs> mathematics there, magnificent. Yeah. So, so nothing, no, you know, we're not throwing any shade on Warsaw here. You know, we just don't want to have the Polish ambassador show up tomorrow morning with a complaint. Yeah, did, people can ask questions, but do they know that this is how we talk? If yes. we're not on stage? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> okay. exactly right. This is, how, this is how business gets done, all right, in Washington, at least between Jay and me. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's no pretense. We're going to open the floor to questions. Mm -hmm. So if we, there's a microphone over on the side. Or if, or you if, could. You, if it's hard to get there, you can, I'll repeat it if you just say it. Sure. I'll, if you, I'll just speak up. Yeah. I'll speak up. Uh, my name is Jeff Kirsch. I'm an attorney from New York. I've worked for the financial crisis from 10 years ago. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're writing Gruntfest's exam for him now. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll try to table it. Like blockchain, distributed ledger technology. I don't think any of us, my colleagues, are here who work in this space, think that it's a fad. It's it's it clearly has applications that are going to add to efficiency, right? I mean, the thing for me are things like you know any, anywhere where we're, we're, where we're so paper intensive and where verification requires a number of steps is right for a technology like this, correct? Like UCCs, like that's an area where there's a ton of paper and every time you refinance, you gotta go through a verification process. There's, there's all sorts of other aspects that, mm -hmm. there's a proxy voting process that we, we, we've just seen now. There are lots of places, any kind of securities uh, transfer. So yes, can, can our old models of doing securities offerings adopt to new technology? Of course they can. But we can't throw out parts of them because we don't like them. So that's, I hope that, that answers your question. Um, and, and I'm sure there are ways to do it. On um, your observation that equity bubbles usually aren't as bad as credit bubbles, I think, yeah, history shows that's true. Um, I, I, I will say that Comparing this bubble to the dot-com bubble, the people who bought those stocks in the dot-com, they did get the protections of the securities laws. They may have been wrong, there may have been a frenzy, but there were financial statements that said, hey, there's not much here, and we're all in this together, and you know, let's go for it. Here, there's none of that. And there may be somebody on the other side of the trade who's getting out, and not telling you. Those are two yep. big differences to me. Yep. And, and let me just go to another question about, about um, you know, the technology morphing. Here's the thing you need to understand. At least this is how I look at you know, blockchain and related technology. 
there's a layer of the technology that exists in effect in crypto space, peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's virtually impossible for the government to change anything at that level. However, as soon as you try to get real money, fiat currency, into this peer-to-peer -peer space protocol layer, or you try to get you know, real money out, all right, at that point, Jay's got you. And regulators from around the world, they got you. So the idea that blockchain is somehow beyond government regulation, it's technically true in a way that's entirely uninteresting. So if, if governments wanted to make it extraordinarily difficult and expensive, all right, to get real money into and out of, all right, the blockchain, they'd be able to do it easily. So let, let's try to find another question. Yes, sir. On the question of individual accountability, I, I, yeah, so I'm I'm familiar with the Yates memo, but but let me let me answer the question very generally. Um, I'll answer it directly and then by means of anecdote. I believe in individual accountability in in the enforcement space. If that's what you're asking, I think it has a greater effect going forward than diffuse corporate responsibility. Corporate responsibility is part of our enforcement regime. It should stay part of it. But when I was in private practice and people would call me up and they would say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? And I wanted to tell them, you know what? I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't pick XYZ company. I would pick a person who had had an enforcement action. Because pointing out a particular person who had gone the wrong way was a much more effective way to communicate the message because people remembered it. Let me ask you a question, Jay. If we looked at the data in terms of SEC enforcement actions since you came on board, would we find an increase in the number of individuals named? On a relative basis, on a percentage basis, I would. I would bet more likely than the other way. We'll I don't know that. I don't know the numbers. I'm sure somebody will figure them we'll, out. We'll have a look. Uh, we, we, got, out. Oh. we got this thing out here what, called databases. What, what I can tell you, though, is what people miss in this is, um, and my, my enforcement colleagues can comment on this better than I can, but uh, bringing a case against an individual mm -hmm. on balance right. requires more time and more resources than bringing a case against an enemy. And Jay, it'd be worthwhile for you to explain to the room why that's typically the case. Well, you know, the stakes are different. Right. A corporation can write a check, maybe get insurance, right, against some of the payments. You going after an individual, it's the individual's livelihood. The individual frequently has an indemnification agreement, all right, with the corporation. So in many situations, especially if the defense is successful, it's not going to cost them anything. Mm -hmm in order to be able to, to mount the defense. Uh, if the defense is unsuccessful, there's a separate set of litigation that can go on about whether you actually get the indemnification. But, but you know, the rule of thumb when I was at the SEC and in private practice negotiating against the SEC is that degree of difficulty going after any individual significantly higher than going after the corporate entity. But it, but it may be worth it. Question from the front row. If you look at the 2017 and 17 ICOs, um, does the SEC anticipate bringing, mm -hmm. does the SEC anticipate bringing any enforcement actions um, or scrutinizing those ICOs? I'm, we're looking at the space. I mean, you know, we brought three actions, and I think we're going to see how it evolves. But yeah, we've got another question over there.
bring an action against one of these platforms that allows people to trade tokens that may or may not be securities, even though the platforms are not registered with the SEC, um, that you know, if there may be market manip manipulation going on on the platforms, what factors drive your decision to take any action against them? Sounds like you have a good professor. <laughs> <laughs> these are all, look, these are all good questions about how, you know, how securities are trading on a platform, whether it's a securities exchange, what registration obligations apply? Those are, those are, those are all good. Those are all good questions. Just like in the da in the twenty one A report, we asked a lot of good questions, and we're and we're we're looking at them. Okay, thank you. We can get a lady right here. So my question is not about ICOs. Um, oh, good. So, <laughs> you know, you the, the whole idea of growing capital formation, when companies are making the decision to go public or not, to go private, they also consider the cost of ongoing reporting. Mm -hmm. And so is there any focus on reducing those costs of the ongoing reporting um, requirements after the IPO? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> so you're going to get rid of the PCOB? <laughs> no. No, it's... Um, the, the ongoing costs of being a public company have greatly outpaced the consumer price index, right? But we've had these technological advances. The one question I ask myself, is kind of philosophically, is with all this advance in technology and ability to verify and whatnot, how come the costs of being a public company have continued to increase at a pace that far outweighs, far outpaces inflation? Like I said, we're, we're, we're busy working on it. We've got a question over here. Hi, thanks again for being here. Um, there has been a lot of debate around the frequency of the reporting requirements, and uh, I think it was Hillary Clinton that mentioned quarterly capitalism as being something that is potentially concerning in an increasingly volatile economy. And um, what is your view on that? And what is the SEC's take on? I, 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 would, I would imagine it's going to be a radical shift if we separate it away from quarterly reporting requirements. But and what, what do you think the implications of that would be? So look, your, your question raises the really good point, which is, I think if you ask people in the abstract, do you want capital to be invested for the longer term? Do you want people to be able to make three and four and five year investment decisions? The answer is absolutely. But, do you, but when you ask people, what do you like about the public capital markets? High on the list is immediate liquidity. And quarterly reporting, is part of immediate liquidity. So that's what we're trying to balance. Now, you know, if we were designing this system from scratch, we might figure out a way to balance those in a different way. But I don't see a I don't I, I don't see an appetite for a radical departure. I mean I I, I'm interested in your views, Joe. Well, first, I think the idea of moving away from quarterly reporting is better for some companies than for others. All right, some companies operate in what I call high twitch markets, where, where things are really moving, all right, and the world <coughs> can change quickly, month to month, <coughs> week to week. Obviously, quarterly reporting is gonna be more valuable to the investors in that type of market. If you have other markets that are more glacial in terms of their evolution, then perhaps moving to semi-annual reporting is something that we could look at. Now, it wouldn't be a terrible thing in my view if the SEC experimented and said, well, all right, we're going to have a pilot group of companies and they're going to go from quarterly to semi-annual reporting and nobody's going to be forced and we're going to try to be intelligent about which companies it is, all right? Um, you might or might not want to say, gee, we'll only do it with shareholder approval, all right? As a 14A8, you know, there, there are all sorts of safeguards that you could have if politically you felt you needed them. 
Um, but the other thing that's, that's really important is to understand that just because history is a particular way doesn't mean it has to be that way in the future. No, there, there, are, there are jurisdictions that had, that had semi-annual reporting for years. I mean, the UK had semi-annual reporting for years. Um, but then there, there is shareholder pressure. Correct. And that's why you'd want to pick a company, and, and that's why you'd want to pick a company where the shareholder pressure wouldn't be perceived as being terrible, mm -hmm. and just politically, because you know, in my experience, when you're at the SEC, if you follow your logic, you will be killed. All right? I, it's just you, you, you have to also understand the politics, and this is the kind of situation where if the majority of shareholders at a company don't want to go to semi-annual. You know, you're going to be hailed up to, to, to Capitol Hill. And there are, other, there are other things people are positing as ways to address hot capital, I including phased voting. That the longer you hold the stock, the more voting, the more votes you get. So that people, you know, inc incentivized all, or you know, you can't really force a company to change tack. But I hate to say this, Jay, if you really want to go to time-based voting, you know what you need? Right. The blockchain. <laughs> Joe, the blockchain is not the answer to all my problems. It's not. You know? <laughs> it's not. But it is the answer to that particular <laughs> problem. Because See, otherwise, it's really hard to... You set this up beforehand, didn't you? No. Uh, 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 we, have, so we have a young lady up front here. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm not a law school student. I'm from the business school next door. So I'm working on a startup based on blockchain. Mm -hmm. And so based, so when I read the security, your remark at the Security Regulation Institute's opening, it gets, like, I kind of got this feeling that, okay, if they are going after lawyers, for many of the unregulated ICOs, the reasonable solution is don't hire a lawyer, don't hire a business school or law school student, just go ahead with it. So. <laughs> And like almost think like 500 IPOs and straight get regulated is a reasonable risk. Mm -hmm. So that makes it really difficult for the other startups who wants to work in the blockchain space. Mm -hmm. In particular, if we want to do a Reg A plus filing, you mentioned that you would love us to go into compliance. If we do do this, how do we, like practically, how do we do that? And does SEC provide any resource to help us to go through that path? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is, if, if you can't, I said in, the, I think, a, a fairly provocative way, which is fair, if you can't rely on lawyers, well then, you know, what should we do? And, you know, we need, to, we need a private bar that operates in this area. We do. I mean, our, our system is built around lawyers facilitating capital markets operating. We didn't create a 200,000 person SEC so that we could assign, we decided not to assign a merits-based regulation system where the SEC got involved in your operation. But you know what I can tell you is, I, w I would not throw the lawyers away just because they haven't been doing as good a job as maybe they should. Right. So and look, the the experience in the real world this has happened to me many times. People call me for advice. I give them the best advice that I can. They say, you know, I, I don't like that advice. And I say, well, I'm not changing my advice because you don't like it. It's like you go to see a doctor, right? The doctor reads the x-ray, says you got a broken leg, and the patient says, I don't like that <laughs> diagnosis. Uh, you know, so, so the problem then is there's a market in which clients will shop, will lawyer shop, until they find a lawyer who's willing to work with them in order to get a particular result. Hi, so I was a federal prosecutor for over a decade, and I was one of the first Bitcoin and cryptocurrency prosecutors, um, was the crypto coordinator for the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. And now I'm no longer with the government, so I can ask you, how do you keep up with, how do you and your staff keep up with all of these technologies? I'm here in Silicon Valley, um, and I feel like now I'm in a different space, but one of the challenges we had at the, at the government and the Justice Department was, you know, now you know there are 1,400 different crypto assets, and, mm -hmm. and every day they're adding new ones. How do you guys keep up with well, this technology? Well, Jay, I know Jay trades crypto uh, <laughs> from 11.15 to noon. You can't get Jay from 11.15 well, to noon. Well, I think some, some people in Silicon Valley, and full, dis full disclosure, I'm on the board of directors of Coinbase, mm -hmm. I think some people here in Silicon Valley wish that 
more regulators and more government mm -hmm. personnel would actually use the platforms and the products so that they knew how they worked mm -hmm. and where are they falling short, where do they need to improve, and have more of that dialogue. So just if you could speak about education and how, how my, is... My, my, my personal education around this? Not or your the, personal. Or the, or the commission. The commission <laughs> and the senior staff, I know you guys have a very sophisticated working group looking at this. Like, how do they keep up and how do you expect them to keep up? They, I, look, I think they've been doing... You, what you posit is, here's something that has kind of exploded and how many people around the world are dedicating every waking hour to trying to make money in this space? Millions in different ways, different places. And how does a 1,000 person enforcement division or uh, add, some, add some of our, th keep up? You know what? It's a great question. We gotta do the best we can. And we've put together a group. I think that the group of people we have understands this space really well. Um, in fact, other areas in the government call us right. to figure out how it's working. Um, and then we have to figure out how to have the most impact. And I'm having a very open discussion with the public, with you, about how to have the most impact to bring the protection back to the people who need it in this space. And that's the question. We had a roundtable discussion today at the commission. said, we know these hard issues. How are we going to have the most impact on getting this back to where it belongs? That's all, that's all I could, you know. So let's go to the back of the room, all the way in back, over there. We have underrepresentation from the back. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there's been a fair amount of consensus after the 21A report on what the law sh kind of is now. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, so when you're going after issuers and lawyers, what's their response with, to the enforcement actions and subpoena? Is it like just kind of put, your, put their hands up and say, sorry, you caught us? Or do they have like certain arguments that they make? And I'm wondering what you're hearing back. You know, that's a, that, I think that's a, a, a good question. I don't have a specific answer because I, you know, I haven't been on the scene of you know th those type of situations or had those conversations. But I, the, one of the reasons I'm pretty comfortable when I say the law is getting a lot clearer is the reaction has been, yeah, okay, you're right. We should we should register. This is a, this is a security, and we should register. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's part of the mystery, very simply, is there, the three enforcement actions that the agency has brought, uh, one of the three settled immediately. It's the Munchy people. All right, the other two, the litigation is still ongoing. And in one of those, there was a separate criminal enforcement proceeding brought in the Eastern District of New York. So I'm just sort of looking at this, and I'm just saying, well, look, I don't see a well, rational... Well, it's, it's also, anyway, I, I don't want to comment on ongoing cases. Uh, perfectly fair. Perfectly fair. But it's really hard for me as a counselor to be able to tell someone, here are the distinguishing characteristics that explain when the SEC goes after an ICO, and here are the situations that explain when the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of New York is going to go after an ICO. Although the Zoslavsky situation was just a flat-out fraud, he didn't even have anything on the blockchain, right? He just said the magic word, blockchain, 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 right? And he thought he was going to get off, but that, that was just plain vanilla traditional fraud. Let's take one last question. Yes, sir. Sure. So this is a different spin on the Warsaw question. It's a follow-up also a follow -up, uh, question to the uh, one that the uh, Coinbase uh, director uh, asked. Um, every day in Silicon Valley, you have busloads of people, uh, corporate uh, representatives, sometimes regulators from other countries that come here to learn, to listen, and to get inspiration, not just on blockchain, but on, on fintech topics. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of processes uh, does the SEC have, or do you, what sort of vision do you have for the SEC to uh, have, g derive inspiration from Silicon Valley and maybe other from other um, uh, jurisdictions, uh, Poland or other places? Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is I've heard from various um, uh, innovators, uh, in the, particularly in blockchain, but not only, that they've decided to move their operations to Europe or Asia because they find that the regulatory environment is more favorable. So obviously, 
you're playing a very difficult balancing act of protecting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the consumer and uh, enabling a fair market, but wh how, how do you ab absorb these, uh, uh, these insights and the inspiration from other markets? So, I, I, if people are leaving this jurisdiction because they think our model, then they, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the easy thing. If people are leaving the US because they think our model for raising capital from the general public is too onerous, go. <laughs> Just leave, you know, because it's a proven model. We can adapt to new technology, but the idea that for somehow we should greatly reduce disclosure, allow a free-for-all trading market, and you know, basically have no custody, no accounting, no none of the protections that our capital markets have been around. That's crazy town. So go. Now, should we should we be looking to add innovation to our marketplace? Absolutely. Like if people can figure out a way to use blockchain technology to to make proxy voting simplistic, I embrace it. Um, if you can figure out a way to enhance trading in the fixed income markets, so the settlement's easier and you don't have to, particularly when you're talking about thinly traded distressed debt, that'd be the greatest. But I'm not gonna throw away you know, investor protection for, uh, let's put it this way, for a quicker adaptation of a technology that if it's as good as people say it is, is gonna be pervasive anyway. Uh, just, just to, uh, Add or maybe clarify my question. So, w do you have listening mechanisms in place to uh, absorb or con uh, innovation oh. or or like to innovation uh, from other places? Other places, yes. yeah. So I, I will I will say this. Yes, and I'm I, I travel abroad to speak to my fellow regulators more than I ever expected I would, and I'm very interested in what they have to say. I can tell you that in this space. It's much more the other way around. Come to you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's Oh, have I have to say one round. thing, Joe. I forgot. Go for it. <laughs> These are my own remarks. There you go. Oh, that's right. These are my own remarks. Not, not those of the commission or Joe Grunfest. <laughs> so, so, by the way, Dan Gallagher, who's a former SEC commissioner and a very dear friend of Jay's and mine, he gave a talk here at Stanford once with the best joke line ever. You know, uh, the views that I'm about to express are my own personal views. Uh, they, they don't reflect the views of the Securities Exchange Commission or the staff, and isn't that a pity? <laughs> <laughs> Best joke line in that context. Yeah, that's pretty La good. Ladies Thank and you, gentlemen, Joe. let's have a big round of applause for our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. There you go.